Welcome to part three of Let's Play Return to Firetop Mountain by Ian Livingstone. Um, at the end of the last part, I was on paragraph 68, and I was about to decide whether to turn around and crawl back along the tunnel, turn to 114, or um, attempt to climb down the shaft, turn to 383. Um, we're going to attempt to climb down the shaft, so we're going to turn to 383. Okay, if you are carrying some rope, turn to 303. If you do not have any rope, turn to 104. Okay, do we have any rope? Um, yep, there it is, right there. I do have some rope. Excellent. So we're going to turn to 303. Oh yeah, um, I will just mention uh, that I do have a fan on in the background because it's very hot today. Um, so if you can hear that, I apologise, but uh, I'm not turning it off because it's extremely hot. I can't stand the heat myself. Roll on winter. Okay. Um, you loop the rope round the metal spike and lower yourself slowly down into the inky blackness of the shaft. You reach the bottom a few metres below and retrieve your rope. If you are carrying a lantern, Turn to 80. If you do not have a lantern, turn to 278. Okay, do we have a lantern? Yep, there it is. It was in the uh, it was in the, uh, the list of items that we start um, with which we started the adventure. So we do have a lantern. So we're going to turn to 80. Um, yep, turn to 80. There it is. Okay, lighting your lantern, you find yourself in a small empty chamber which has a tunnel leading from its far wall. Uh, there appears to be a message on this wall, written in yellow chalk. If you want to read the message, turn to 323. If you would rather walk straight along the tunnel, turn to 372. Okay, um, we're not going to read the message, we're going to walk straight along the tunnel, so turn to 372. Yeah, I think the message is like a nasty curse or something like that, I can't remember. 372, here we go. Okay, uh, the tunnel leads into a candlelit room. Oh, there we go, there's, uh, 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 there's the word candlelit again, except they haven't missed out the first L. Anyway, uh, the tunnel leads into a candlelit room. It is littered with many skulls, human and animal alike. Two candles, both of which are burning in their brass holders, are mounted on wooden pedestals on either side of the tunnel's entrance. In the opposite wall, the tunnel continues into the distance lit by a long line of torches. You step into the room and as you do so the skulls start to shuffle towards you, making the floor by now the tunnel's entrance look like a cobbled path. If you try to leap over the skulls, turn to 47. If you would rather brave walking through them, turn to 173. Okay, we're going to try and leap over them. Um, so, 47. Or jump over them. Is there, is there a difference between leap and uh, jump? When I think of leap, I think of sort of like a running, um, a running jump. So maybe a leap is just a running jump. I don't know. Anyway, that's what I think anyway. That's the feeling that comes uh, that comes to mind. Anyway, um, or interpretation rather. You take a couple of steps back. It, yeah, that's that reminds me actually of another annoyance. Um, sometimes people say, uh, for example, a couple steps. It doesn't make any sense. It's a couple of steps because a couple is a noun in itself. Anyway. Um, you take a couple of steps back, except, of course, when you say a few steps, you don't say a few of steps, but I suppose because few in that instance is acting like an adjective, such as few, fewer, and fewest. So I suppose that's acceptable not to put the of after a few steps, but uh, certainly with a couple, um, it should be a couple of every time. Anyway. You take a couple of steps back, then run forward and jump as far as you can over the skulls. Roll two dice. If the total is less than or equal to your skill, turn to 168. If the total is greater than your skill, turn to 261. Okay, so we need to roll two dice, and it needs to be less than or equal to 12, which is pretty much guaranteed, but we'll do it anyway. Yep, uh, and we've got a four, just remove the buzzing. 
which won't make much difference because I have a fan on, but um, I, don't, I don't even think you can hear the fan or the buzzing, to be honest, but I can, and it's annoying. Anyway, we've got a four, so that means we uh, uh, we will turn to 168 because four is less than or equal to 12, so turn to 168. Okay, here we go. You just managed to clear the skulls, and without stopping to look around, you run on into the new tunnel. Turn to 314. Fantastic. Fantastic. Right. Now the tunnel ends at a solid wooden door. You try the handle, and it turns. Uh, the door opens into another small stone-walled room with a door in the wall opposite. There is a trap door in the floor in the middle of the room, which is empty, apart from an ornate oak chair carved with figures standing in one corner. Will you open the door opposite? Turn to 283. Um, will you open the trap door, or uh, the trap door rather? Uh, turn to 368. Um, or will you sit on the oak chair? Turn to 269. Uh, we're going to open the door opposite. Turn to 283. Here we go. Uh, the door opens into a large room with a domed ceiling. Uh, the floor is made of polished marble on which three statues stand facing you, each mounted on a marble plinth. The statues are of warriors and they all look as though their faces were set in stone at the very moment of a horrible death. Their open mouths and screwed up eyes give the impression of sudden and intense pain. A fourth plinth stands on the floor, but with no statue mounted on it, and there is another door in the wall opposite. As you enter the room to take a uh, yeah, as you enter the room to take a closer look at the statues, the door behind you slams shut. At the same time, a wide section of one wall starts to rise up. You can see the tail of a huge snake flick out from under the rising wall, and you hear loud hissing sounds. Will you try to open the new door? Turn to 138. Try to open the door through which you came. Turn to 381. Um, or will you get ready to fight? Turn to 294. Let's have a quick look at this picture. Pretty nasty. There's the... Uh, looks like a rattlesnake. Um, we are going to get ready to fight. Turn to 294. Not, um, not too far to go. Will you fight your new adversary with your eyes open, turn to 265, or closed, turn to 31? Um, well, it's a bit like uh, the Gorgon, isn't it? Medusa the Gorgon, uh, because uh, because of the statues and everything. So we're going to fight with our eyes closed. Turn to 31. Okay. Oops, wrong way. There we go. You turn your head away before the hideous creature can look you in the eyes, knowing that catching her glance for just a second will be enough to turn you to stone. You must act quickly to defeat her. Will you attack her with your sword, with your free hand covering your eyes, turn to 393, or search your backpack for an item to use against her, turn to 66. Again, we're going to search our backpack, turn to 66. Let's see what we have. If you are carrying any of the following items, you have time to grab just one before the advancing Gorgon is upon you. Will you choose... I think Gorgon shouldn't be capitalised there, because it's a noun. It isn't the name of anything. It's... It's... Uh, it's a Gorgon. So, it, um, it shouldn't be capitalised there. Anyway, um... In, anyway, I can't remember what I said now. Will you choose garlic, turn to 15, um, a mirror, turn to 231, or a whistle, turn to 334? If you have none of these articles, you will have to attack the gorgon with your sword after all, turn to 293. Okay, we're going to use a mirror, that's the obvious thing to do. Okay, 231. You hurriedly take the mirror out of your backpack and, with eyes tight shut, 
tightly shut and um, hold it in front of you hoping to reflect yeah because uh, that tight there is describing another adjective uh, uh, which is the word shut so it should be tightly shut because we need an adverb an adverb either describes a verb or another adjective you know um, it's like saying um, extremely blue you wouldn't say extreme blue because you need extremely because it's an adverb that's describing another adjective uh, so in this instance we need tightly shut because it's describing shut Anyway, with eyes tightly shut, um, hold it out in front of you. I'll just start again. Um, you hurriedly take the mirror out of your backpack, and with eyes tightly shut, hold it um, hold it out in front of you, hoping to reflect the gorgon's deadly gaze back at her. Test your luck. If you're lucky, turn to 96. If you're unlucky, turn to 256. Um, excuse me just for one moment, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, a house fly just landed on my laptop screen and I paused it to turn around to get my electric fly swatter. And, and naturally, of course, when I turned back, it had gone. Um, it couldn't have ended it any other way, could it? Anyway, let's just get on with this. Okay, test your luck. So we need to be lucky here. Um, fiddle D. So what's our luck at the moment? It's 11, so we need to get dice score of 11 or less or lower and we get a 10 that was close but we still have to put our luck down to 10 points there we go okay so we were lucky uh, 10 to 96 um, yeah 96 Uh, the Gorgon catches sight of her own deadly gaze in the mirror and lets out a brutal, ear-piercing scream. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention if we did have a mirror or not. Um, that's what I forgot to check. Uh, yeah, there it is, it's next, to the, uh, next to the rope. Did I, mirror magnifying glass. Oh, whatever. Uh, 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 yeah, that's a mirror, so... A mirror magnifying glass is a type of mirror, I suppose. So. Anyway, enough of that. Anyway, the Gorgon catches sight of her own deadly gaze in the mirror and lets out a brutal, ear-piercing scream. Suddenly motionless, she begins to tremble and her scaly skin slowly lightens until it is the colour of sand. In a few seconds, she turns to stone to become a statue in her own lair. You allow yourself a grim smile while wondering what other hideous creatures still lie in wait inside Zagor's mountain labyrinth. If you want to open the door in the far wall, turn to 347. If you would rather investigate the adjoining chambers from which the Gorgon emerged, turn to 209. Okay, we're going to open the door in the far wall. So, turn to 347. Yeah, that's the price to pay for having the window open because it's hot. It lets all the flies in. And they'll be buzzing around my head uh, for, for hours to come until I get the little critter. Right, <coughs> here we go. Oh, it's that, uh, it's that picture I saw earlier. It's about, it looks like an orc about to eat a rat. Lovely. The door is chained and padlocked, but using a spear taken from one of the statues, you soon force the lock open. The door looks as if it has been closed for years, and you have to you have to tug hard on the handle. Slowly, you manage to drag the door open while its rusty hinges creak noisily. Beyond, you see a torch-lit tunnel. About ten metres ahead, there is a door with a barred window with a barred window in it. You tiptoe quietly along the tunnel and peep through the window. Sitting at a rough wooden table, an orc is being served what looks like rat stew by a grisly-looking hunchbacked dwarf. An ugly purple scar runs down the dwarf's face from his left eyebrow to his chin. The orc is as ugly and brutal looking as they come. You keep watching as the orc pulls a rat carcass out of the stew with his fingers and eats it, um, head and all. Under the table you spot a wooden crate. If you wish to open the door and attack the orc, turn to 227. If you would rather walk on down the tunnel, turn to 13. And there's the orc, what a lovely sight, eating his rat stew. 
Okay, um, we're going to open the door and attack the orc. Not usually the best advice, but in this instance we have to attack the orc. So we're going to turn to 227. He isn't that tough, so don't worry. 227. <clears throat> um, on seeing you barge into the room, the orc immediately kicks over the table, sending its stew bowl flying. Grabbing its sword, the orc leaps at you while the dwarf runs into the back room. Um, orc, skill 6, stamina 5. Let's deal with that now. Okay, so orc, skill 6, stamina 5. Let's do this now. Okay, so let's roll for him first. So it's this plus 6. 11 plus 6 is uh, 17. I have 12. 12 plus 4 is 16. Unbelievable, he actually beat me. Uh, 17, and uh, I get 16. Fantastic. Whoops, there's a thing there. So he takes the first blood from me, so I have to lose some lose some health, or oh, some stamina as it's called. Lovely. Okay, next. Okay, he gets a 9. 9 plus uh, 6 is uh, 15. I get a 3. 3 plus 12 is... Oh, 15. Unbelievable. 15, so I'll use even more. How could this orc do so much damage to me? Uh, what did he get? Uh, 16 to 15, wasn't it? Where is it? 16 to 15. Alright, could this be the time when I turn it all around? He gets a 9, that's 15. I get... Wait a minute. Now, wait a minute, I won that because he get he got 15, and, and, and what did I get? Because he got 15, because he got 9. Did I get 4, or did I get 3? I can't remember, but I'll, I'll assume I lost, because I think I lost, but I probably but I probably didn't, but I have to do it like this now. Um, I should have... I should have paid attention. You anyway, know, 15, I get 8, that's 20. So 15 to 20. Yeah, I should have paid attention. 15 to 20, so I definitely get this now. Right, 3. Two more hits. I won't use any luck, it's a waste. Uh, 6, that's 12 for him. 11, that's uh, 23 to me. So 11 to 23. No, 12 to 23. I really can't remember today. 12 to 23. Put them down to one. Okay, last one. If he gets a nine, that's 15 again. And I get a four, that's 16. So 15 to 16, I win. I think that's what I got last time, but I forgot. So I win that. So that's the end of Mr. Orc. Okay, what's next? Okay, um, if you win, you take the Orc's sword. However, you hardly have time to catch your breath before the dwarf runs back into the room swinging a warhammer. Um, dwarf, skill 6, stamina 4. Okay, now we're doing the dwarf. Dwarf, skill 6. I don't know why the dwarf is on his side. Stamina 4. Okay, so now we're doing the dwarf. It's just two hits needed. Okay, he gets an 8, that's 14. I get a 7, that's 19. So 14 to 19. Yep, 14 to 19. It's another two. One more hit and the dwarf is finished. And he gets a seven. That's uh, 13. I get a 12. That's 24. So 13 to 24 and I win. Good. And that's the end of him. Right, okay. So another dwarf. There's no buzzing this time. Okay, so if you win, turn to 243. And we also have a sword. Another sword for some reason. I don't know why we have to pick that up, but... Uh, we also have dark blade sword. Now we have another sword. Oh, I, don't know. I don't know what the point of it is. Okay, all right. So ten to two hundred and forty-three. If you are suffering from Zagor's curse of the demon's breath, turn to one hundred ninety-seven. Um, otherwise, will you leave the room and turn right into the tunnel? Turn to thirteen. Uh, you open the wooden crate, turn to 375, or enter the back room, turn to 132. Okay, uh, we're going to open the wooden crate, and we're not suffering from this curse thing. 
So 375, here we go. You soon prise the lid off the crate and find that it is filled with cabbage leaves, most of which are rotten. The smell rising up from the crate is horrible. You rummage distastefully through the leaves and find a small silver bell. You put it in your backpack and consider what to do next. If you want to leave the room and turn right into the tunnel, turn to 13. If you want to enter the back room and have not done so already, turn to 132. Okay, we're going to take the silver bell, of course. So, silver bell. There we go. And then we're going to leave the room and turn right into the tunnel, 10 to 13. Lovely. All right, where are we? No, wrong one. You soon come to another door, but this time there is no window th through which to look. Uh, you press your ear to the door and hear what sounds like somebody moaning in pain. Um, if you want to open the door, turn to 118. He's probably reading. Um, uh, he's probably reading one of Tim Vine's joke books. That's why he's moaning. But if you don't know who Tim Vine is, um, look him up. Anyway, if you want to open the door, turn to 118. If you'd rather walk on, turn to th uh, 387. We're going to open the door. 118. The door opens into a dingy cell. Two rats scurry across the dirty, straw-covered floor as you enter. On the far wall you see a thin man wearing red trousers. He is sitting on the floor and his hands are chained to the wall. A bandage covers his eyes. The man panics as he hears your footsteps. He presses himself against the wall and cries, No, no more pain, no more pain. You think you recognise his voice and try to think of his name. Is it Zoot Zimmer, 10 to 57, or Fergus Finn, 10 to 287? Let's have a quick look at him. There he is, there are the two rats as well. What a great picture. I really wish I could draw that well, but uh, my drawing is... My draw... Um, I mean, his drawing there to my skill at drawing is the same as my skill at drawing to the sk skill of drawing of uh, probably a chimpanzee. Anyway... Um, yeah, um, it's Zoot Zimmer. Let's have a quick look at this. Um, Zoot Zimmer lives at number 36. That's all I have, really. But, um, is it Zoot Zimmer, turn to 57? I recognise that name. Um, that is indeed my name, stranger, but how did you know it? Have we met somewhere before? Before I can trust you, I need to be convinced that you do know me. Can you tell me the number of my house in Hobnail Street? If you know the number of the house, uh, turn to the paragraph with that number. If you do not, if, if you do not, turn to 176. Blimey, he's remarkably picky for someone who's being tortured and I'm about to rescue him. Oh, oh no, please don't rescue him. I have to be sure that you know where I live. Otherwise, I'll, if you don't know where I live, I'll happily just carry on being chained and blindfolded and being tortured every day. It, it's all right. I mean, seriously. All right, anyway, so we know the number. Um, so we, we're going to turn to 36, because that's what I had written down. Zoot Zim lives at 36. Um, where is he? It's this one. There we go. Oh, it's a big one. Uh, so, you must indeed be a friend, Zoot says excitedly, or I tortured someone who knows you where you live. Anyway, Zoot says excitedly, um, Alas, I will not be able to recognise you. While I was flying back to Card on my giant eagle, a fire dragon attacked. I was blinded and my beautiful eagle was badly burnt. We crash-landed in some trees. The eagle, in her last heroic moment, saved my life, but gave up her own, trying to shield me. An orc patrol picked me up and brought me here gleefully telling me that my left arm was to be sewn onto Zagor in place of his own rotten bones. Set me free and I'll help you defeat this evil warlock. You prise open his iron shackles and help him to his feet. I may be blind, but I'm still a half-elf. My sense of touch may well prove useful in this trap-infested hellhole. Let's go. You lead Zoot out of the room and turn right along the tunnel, which ends, however, at a stone wall. There are footprints on the floor which all point towards the end wall. 
you tell Zoot that you think there may be a secret door in the wall. He runs his fingers slowly over the wall, searching for hairline cracks. He soon finds a loose stone and carefully pulls it out. Uh, there is an iron handle in, in the recess. This handle will open the secret door, but I think there's a hidden trap attached to it. There may be another way of opening the door. At the foot of the wall, he finds another loose stone with another handle behind it. Uh, this will be the one, I'm sure. Hello, I found something else. Here, take a look and tell me what it is. It is a large tooth made of solid gold, which has the number uh, 186 stamped on it. At one point to your luck. Okay, gold tooth... Um, 186, wasn't it? And we add one point to our luck new line, I think. So we're back to 11 luck points. Wonderful. Um, yeah, 186. A zoot smiles when you describe it to him. Stand back while I turn this handle. You never know, I've been wrong before. He turns the handle and you hear a click. The secret door swings open inwards. But at the same time, the floor stone on which Zoot is standing drops away beneath him. You hear his loud scream fade away as he falls to his death at the bottom of a spiked pit. Spurred on by sudden anger, you leap across the pit and through the doorway, landing safely in a cross tunnel. The secret door swings slowly back and slams shut, and now you cannot even tell that it is there. Looking to the left, you see an iron portcullis in the left-hand wall of the tunnel, which goes on for another 20 metres before ending at the mass of rubble of a cave-in. Looking right, the tunnel continues for 20 metres before turning left. If you want to take a look at the portcullis, turn to 253. If you'd rather go to the right, turn to 3. Okay, wonderful. Uh, we're going to go to the right, so turn to 3. There we are. On turning the corner, um, you come across an old wooden bench above which there is a sign, but the painted words on the sign have all but flaked off. All you can make out is the first word, which is rest. If you want to sit down on the bench, turn to 211. If you'd rather walk on, turn to 162. Now here is a nice little Easter egg here. This is, if you remember the first book, there was a bench that said, rest ye here, a weary traveller, and it gave you some stamina. So this is like a reminder that it's, it's a clue if you've read the first book. Um, so we're going to sit down on the bench. The first word in that was rest as well. So we're going to sit down on the bench and turn to 211. It's a nice little Easter egg of Ian Livingstone to put that in. Um, wait a minute, nice little Easter egg of Ian Livingstone uh, to put that here. Okay, I was going to make, make sure that made sense. After sitting down on the bench, you begin to feel relaxed. Your aches and pains are slowly soothed away by the healing properties of the enchanted bench. Um, regain two stamina points and one skill point. Let's do that now. So then back to 21. Now we haven't lost any skill. Um, with renewed energy and determination, you set off down the tunnel, 10 to 162. You soon arrive at a junction in the tunnel. There is another cave-in in in the left-hand tunnel, some 30 metres further on. Uh, the roof of the tunnel to your right has also caved in, but there is a new branch in the left-hand wall just before the cave-in. You decide to make a quick right-left turn and make you way up, then you make your way up the new branch. The new tunnel soon ends at a sturdy wooden door. You try the handle and it turns. You peer around the door and see a human skeleton lying on the floor of a dust-covered room. There is a fine-looking sword in the skeleton's hand. If you need a sword, turn to 225. Um, otherwise you may either open an old box that is in one corner of the room, turn to 93, or leave the room through the door in the far wall, turn to 121. So what's the point of Dark Blade's sword? Because it didn't really do any good. Anyway. Um, okay, we do not need a sword. Uh, so, so we're going to ignore the, the box and we're going to leave the room through the door in the far wall. Turn to 121. 
The door opens into a short corridor which ends a few metres ahead at another wooden door. You listen but hear nothing. You try the handle and it turns, and you walk into a room which is richly decorated. The floor is of polished marble and the walls are painted... Whoops, highlighted a bit there. Walls are painted white, um, although grown dull and faded over the years. There are four paler square patches, one on each wall, where you guess paintings used to hang. There is a door in the far wall which suddenly opens, and a tall muscular creature with long arms enters the room. It stops in its tracks when it sees you and starts to draw. Its long, tusk-like teeth protrude menacingly from its bottom jaw. Armed with a spiked club, the savage cave troll runs forward to attack. Cave troll, skill 9, stamina 9. Okay, so we have to fight this cave troll, 9-9. Nine, nine. Lots of fighting today. Skill, 9. Stamina, 9. Okay, let's do this. Right, him first, as always. Okay, he gets an 8. 8 plus 9 is 17. I get 11. 11 plus 12 is 23. So, 17 to 23. I win the first one. Goes down to seven. I won't use any luck, like always. Um, he gets a three. That's twelve. I get eight. That's twenty. So twelve to twenty. That was good. He goes down to five. Mr. Cave Troll is down to five now. Nearly done. Right. He gets a twelve. That's uh, twenty-one. I get, I get seven. That's nineteen. Spoke too soon. Twenty-one to nineteen. So he does some damage on me. I wonder where that damn fly went. I'll have to kill that later. Uh, right, 19. Deal with that later, lest it keep me up all night. Buzzing around my head. Bzz, bloody annoying. Anyway, um, okay, roll, uh, roll again for the uh, cave troll. He gets 11, that's 20. I get 10, that's 22. That's good. Thought I was lost there, so I thought I'd lost some there. 20 to 22. Down to three. Okay, he gets a six. That's uh, 15. I get 10. That's 22. So 15 to 22. Goes down to one. One more hit. Okay, he gets a five. That's 14. I get four. That's 16. So 14 to 16, and he's dead. Good. And he's down to naught. Good. Let's end of Mr. Cave Troll. Get rid of the buzzing. If you win, turn to 284. Um, a pouch on the Cave Troll's belt holds three copper pieces. Some garlic, a crude metal earring in the shape of an earwig and a piece of paper with the word leg written on it. Perhaps the cave troll was on a mission to find Zagor a leg for his new body. <laughs> That's quite clever. You may take any or all of the copper pieces, the garlic and the piece of paper, and decide what to do with the earring. Okay. Um, we're going to take the copper pieces, the garlic, um, and the piece of paper. That's copper pieces, so I'll just put... Uh, three copper pieces. Now I'll write them here. I don't know. I'll just put. I'll put a separate thing. Um, and put. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll just write copper out and then put three. There we go. Uh, so we have garlic. New line, wasn't it? Garlic and piece of paper. Leg. There we go. Brilliant. Right, it's all the all the booty from there taken care of. Anyway, decide what you want to do with the earring. If you want to wear it, turn to 100. Otherwise, you walk up to the door ahead, turn to 149. Um, we're going to walk up to the door ahead. I don't think the earring is very nice. So. 149. Let's not wear the earring. Something nasty. Or he turns us into an earwig or something. I don't know. There we go, finally. 
You open the door and walk along a narrow tunnel. It turns briefly to the right and then to the left, where there is a small alcove. Walking on, you arrive at another wooden door with a carved bone handle. Hearing no sound coming from the other side of the door, you turn the handle. You enter a strange pear-shaped room with a rough stone floor. Uh, there is another door in the far wall, and on one side of the room there is a pile of rubble. You suddenly spot a small creature lying asleep on the rubble pile. It has large ears and a long nose, and is wearing only a loin cloth. Um, a dagger and a pouch lie by the troglodyte's head. If you want to tiptoe over to the next uh, door, turn to 330. If you, if you prefer to sneak up to the troglodyte and take its dagger and pouch, turn to 45. And we're going to sneak up to the troglodyte, so we're going to turn to 45. As you creep over towards the sleeping troglodytes, you stumble and trip over the rough floor. What a surprise. Test your luck. If you're lucky, turn to 70. If you're unlucky, turn to 191. Okay, luck is currently 11, so we need 11 or less. And then both dice rolls. And we get an 8, so we were lucky, but we still have to use up a luck point, as always. Okay, down to 10 again. So it's gone 11, 10, 9, 10, 11, 10, 11, 10. So we were lucky, uh, and we're turning to 70. Uh, presumably we'd have to fight it if, if we were unlucky. Oh, they're, the, they're those things that look like the Wire Twins from Hellraiser Inferno again. Yes, it's weird, that film. Uh, uh, that scene is weirdly erotic, but uh, they're really ugly and they go under his skin. It's, it's, you know, it's very confusing um, from an erotic point of view. Anyway, um, regaining your balance, you bent... Uh, I'm not saying they're erotic, I'm saying the things on Hellraiser Inferno are erotic. Or the scene on that film is erotic. Uh, anyway, um, regaining your balance, you bend over the sleeping troglodyte and pick up its throwing dagger and pouch. Inside the pouch you find a piece of slate with the word arrow scratched on it. You put this in your pocket and slip the dagger down the side of your boot. Seeing nothing else of interest, you tiptoe quietly over to the far door. Okay, so we have piece of slate arrow and then new line um, dagger. Brilliant. There are lots of booty. Is that a space? No, it's not good. Um, brilliant. Uh, yeah, tip, um, seeing nothing else of interest, you tiptoe quietly over to the far door, 10 to 158. Uh, the door leads into a... Uh, let's start again. The door leads into a tunnel which has been roughly cut into the mountain. It widens out until you find yourself in a large sand-covered cavern through which a river flows. On the near side bank of the river, a few stumps of wood sticking out of the water look like the remains of a bridge. To their left, an old cracked bell hangs from a post. A sign is nailed to the post, but it is too faded to read anything except the word ferry. The river is fast-flowing and looks too deep and treacherous for you to try swimming across. So you decide to ring the bell, hoping to attract a ferryman. The, uh, the bell gives out a dull clang, and a few moments later, a withered old man in a small wooden boat approaches the riverbank. Jump in, he says gruffly. Two gold Zagors to cross. Payment in advance. You assume that inside the mountain, Zagor must enforce the use of his gold coins. If you have two gold pieces with the letter Z stamped on them, and wish to pay the ferryman, turn to 299. If you do not have the coins or do not wish to pay, turn to 260. Okay, um, we have the coins, but we do not wish to pay. Uh, so, because we do have some Zagors. Um, yeah, we have three with Z, and then we have another five without Z. But we do not wish to pay, so we're going to turn to 260. Now, this is another throwback, another reference to the first uh, to the first book. This was in the first book. Anyways, but we're not going to pay, so we're going to turn to 260. Like before, he's a were-rat. The old man becomes angry and steps out of the boat. You'll pay for wasting my time, he says in a voice that sounds almost animal. He starts to expand in size. A bulging torso replaces his hollow chest. His jaw elongates and his bared teeth are, s are sharp and pointed. 
thick hair sprouts all over his body. Uh, the old man has transformed himself into a were-rat. With claws outstretched, he attacks. Were-rat, skill 8, stamina 5. Okay, let's do this. Were-rat, 8-5. Okay, right, okay. So he gets his first roll is, yep, is a 5, that's 13. I get a 5, that's 17. So 13 to 17. That means he loses, so he, he goes down to 3. It's two more hits. Okay, he gets a 4. That's uh, 12, and I get a 12, that is 24. So 12 to 24, that was an easy victory one. 12 to 24. So 1, okay, last one hopefully. Okay, he gets a 7, 8 plus 7 is 15, I get an 8, that's 20. So 15 to 20, that means he's dead, good. At least for now. Okay, brilliant. Get rid of the buzzing, lovely. Okay, if you win, turn to 216. Let's go. Um, in the whereats pocket, you find a gold piece with the letter Z stamped on it. However, there is nothing else <coughs> of use. Okay, so that means we can add to our Z, our Z um, we can add to our gold zaggles. Uh, so now we have four gold zaggles. I'll just get rid of that uh, comma, we don't need that. Okay, so let's continue. Um, so you jump into the boat and row, uh, and row yourself across the river. You are about halfway across when suddenly the boat turns of its own accord and starts to float down river, and no amount of work on the oars by you can alter its course. Uh, the river narrows as the walls of the cavern close in. The roof of the cavern lowers until you have to keep below the gun... Whale of the... I've never heard of that word before. Well, until the, since the last time I read this book. Um, so you have to keep below the gunwale of the boat to avoid bumping it. Thankfully, the narrow tunnel soon opens out into another large cavern. This one is filled with giant crystals, all sparkling and glinting in the light of many torches. The boat veers to the left and slides up onto a stony bank. You climb out and stand facing two tunnels. The word pits is chiselled into the stone above the left-hand tunnel, and the word puzzles is chiselled above the right-hand one. Will you examine the giant crystals? Um, turn to 247. Uh, will you enter the left-hand tunnel? Turn to 124. Or enter the right-hand tunnel? Turn to 38. Now, I remember this. If you examine the giant crystals, I think one of them turns into uh, a diamond sentinel, and you can't kill him without some sort of special item or spell or something, and he's really dangerous. So you don't want to examine the giant crystals, I think, because I think they're really nasty. Um, so we're going to enter the right-hand tunnel. Uh, so turn to 38. This will be the last paragraph, by the way. We've just gone past 43 minutes. Anyway, 38. You step warily into the torch-lit tunnel. In the distance, you can see that the tunnel opens out into another cavern lined with bookshelves that are crammed with hundreds of books. Standing in the middle of the cavern is a black-robed person whose folded arms are concealed in baggy sleeves which almost touch the floor. A large black hood completely covers the figure's head. Enter, stranger, a deep voice calls. Um, shades of uh, tray guard from Nightmare there. You have chosen the path of the puzzles. I am the Inquisitor. It is your task to it is your task to prove to me that you are worthy to pass th through my domain, and only by the power of your mind shall you do so. Fail, and you shall die. Step forward and listen carefully. Your test begins. If you want to obey the Inquisitor, turn to 262. If you'd rather attack him, turn to 141. Okay, so we're going to... I can't resist doing a puzzle, so I'm going to do another one. Um, so we're going to turn to 262, and then after I do a puzzle, then I'll end the video. 262, because we're going to obey him, of course. Probably not a good idea to uh, defy him or disobey. I don't really know what the difference between those two words is. But yeah, we're going to obey him, so turn to 262. Oh, he gets his own picture. There he is. 
You tell the Inquisitor that you are ready. Good, he replies. There are two puzzles that you have to solve. He holds out his arms in front of him, and suddenly a sword appears in his right hand, and a dagger appears in his left hand. The sword and dagger that you see are together worth 300 copper pieces. The sword is worth 200 copper pieces more than the dagger. How much is the dagger worth? If you can work out the answer, turn to the paragraph with that number. If you do not know the answer, turn to 127. Okay, now here we need to do a bit of algebra, which is my speciality. Now, the sword and dagger that you see are together worth 300 copper pieces. The sword is worth 200 copper pieces more than the dagger. How much is the dagger worth? Uh, so together, both together, so let x and y, for example, uh, let x, um, let, uh, let's let x plus y equal 300. And then... Uh, and we also know that um, uh, okay, right. Okay, this is this is an algebra situation here. Right, let's just do some algebra. I'll do it right at the bottom. Now let's do it here. Right, okay. So let's do it right here. Okay, so x is the sword, is the sword, for example, and then let y be the the dagger. Now we know, because this is given in the problem, that x plus y equals 300. Okay, that's definite. Now what, what other information do we have? We have that the sword is worth 200 copper pieces more than the dagger. Okay, so sword, so x is 200 plus is y plus 200 so, so x equals y plus 200 because the sword is worth two is worth 200 copper pieces more than a dagger and we know the dagger is equal to y so x is the sword so x equals y plus 200 so let's write that down that's another thing so x equals y plus 200 that we know. And then it's just a simple case of substitution. So we know that x equals y plus 200, so we just have to put put the first equation into the second equation. So uh, substitute x, this x, so y plus 200 plus y equals 300. So let's put that in. y, and that's capital Y, whoops, y plus 200 uh, plus y, because uh, that's the x, uh, the y plus 200 equals x. Now we're doing plus the y in the first equation equals 300. Okay, and then it's just a simple case of combining like terms. So 2y, because y plus y equals 2y, 2y plus 200, uh, 2y is just 2 times y. Uh, when we deal with algebra, we ignore multiplication uh, signs unless it's absolutely necessary, unless uh, because we just assume that if if uh, if a number and a letter is together or a le two letters are together, it, it's always multiplication. So yeah, so two y plus two hundred, which means two times y, because we have y plus y. Uh, y plus y is two y. In the same case that two plus two is two times two, or two uh, th three plus three is two times three. The same thing applies to y because y is a number. We just don't know what it. What, uh, we just don't know its its value yet, but we definitely know it's a number. Equals 300, and then now what we do? We subtract 200 from each side because we know those both sides are equal. 2y plus 200 equals 300. So now we just have to subtract 200 from each side. 200 minus 200 is naught, so we just end up with 2y, and then 300 minus 200 equals 100. So 2y equals 100. And then we just need to divide by 2. 2y divided by 2 is y. In the same case that 2 times 5 is 10. Divided by 2 is 5. 2 times 5 uh, divided by 5 is is 5. So 2 times y divided by 2 is also equal to uh, is equal to just y. And we know what 100 divided by 2 is. It equals 50. So y equals 50. And that means we can work out what x is. If we put it back into the first equation. So that would be x plus x plus 50 equals 300. So now it's just another case of just uh, subtracting 50 from both sides. x plus 50 minus 50 is naught, or well, it's just x plus naught, so it's x, 
and then 300 minus 50 equals 250. So x equals 250 and y equals 50. That's a very, very simple um, system of simultaneous equations. We have two unknowns and they're very easy to solve. So x equals 250, y equals 50. So the answer to the problem, whatever it is, what I've just solved, and how much is, he asks, how much is the dagger worth? If you can work out the answer, turn to the paragraph with that number. Okay, so the dagger, I said the dagger was uh, y. So I know that y is 50. So we can turn to 50. So yeah, the sword and dagger that you see are together worth 300 copper pieces. Yeah, so 250 plus 50 is 300. But the sword is worth 200 copper pieces more than a dagger. And that makes sense as well, because 250 is 200 more than 50. So that makes sense. Now, the, easy, if, the easiest mistake to make is not to use algebra and think, oh, well, that's obvious, it's just 200 and 100. But that doesn't work, because if we put, if we put the, uh, for example, um, here, um, if we put x equals 200 and y equals 100, then... Um, then, then, uh, that, uh, then that means x would be 200, and uh, y would be 100. And, that, uh, and as we know, as I've already defined x to be the value of the sword, that means uh, the sword would be worth 200 copper pieces more than the dagger. And that means the dagger would, because uh, 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 because the sword is worth 200, because of you know, I've just defined, I've just said, oh, let's assume that's 200. I'll just write this down, actually. Let's assume, erroneously, that x equals 200. Let's assume that for a start. So I've just assumed x equals 200. Now, I know from this that, that x is the sword, uh, because that's the sword, um, and that I, that I know also that x plus y equals 300. So x plus y equals 300. I know that because he or has, he has already told me that the value of both of them, the sword and the dagger, so the value of x plus y equals 300. That's the same as the last one. That's There's nothing you can do about that. That, that, that is fixed. Uh, that, uh, that's completely fixed because that's what he's told me. x plus y equals 300. But if I assume that x equals 200, then, uh, then that means because the uh, uh, because they're both worth uh, 300, that means if I put x in this one, so 200 plus y equals 300, that means, you know, this is the easiest mistake to make, but you just have to put it in to prove that it isn't right. That means if I subtract 200 from both sides, y would have to equal 100. But that is a contradiction, because we can't have that, because we know that... Uh, 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 because we also know that um, that, they, uh, that 200 is uh, um, 200 is not 200 more. 200 is not 200 more than 100. It's only 100 more. So that means the next equation would have to be the next equation has to be x equals uh, y plus 200. Uh, you know, so that means that x. Um, would have to be 200. So 200 would have to be, that means if we put x into this one, 200 would have to be y plus 200. But that can't work because that means y would have to be naught. And that means if it were naught, that means x plus y couldn't be 300 because 200 plus naught is 200. So we get a contradiction. So there's no possible way that the sword could be worth 200 and the dagger worth 100. Uh, 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 because, simply because that we know that x must be y plus 200. The value of the sword must be the value of the dagger plus 200. But that can't be if the sword is worth 200 because that means 200 would have to equal the value of the dagger plus 200, meaning that y would have to be naught. And so that would be a contradiction. y would have to be naught, but it can't be naught. But it can't be naught because we know that x plus y must equal 300. So it can't possibly be that. So there's no possible way that we could just simply say, oh, it's obviously 200 and 100. It can't work. The only way that works with this is x to be 250 and y equals 50. That's the only thing that works. So that's the answer. Um, so y is actually 50. And that's the answer. But yeah, you can work that out without algebra. Algebra just simplifies it beautifully, making it into a beautiful little um, simple 
uh, system of um, simultaneous equations with two unknowns. Absolutely perfect to solve, if you know what you're doing. Okay, the sword and dagger disappear from the Inquisitor's hands. He folds his arms again slowly and says, Correct, now for the second puzzle. You must tell me my age from the information I shall give you. I first went to the school of evil magic when I was four and a half years of age, and I stayed there for a sixth of my life. Um, then I went to the school of um, demonic sorcery for a fifth of my life. I then studied under the great necromancer Hellmoon for a quarter of my life, and since then, for a third of my life, I have been in the service of Zagor. If you can work out the Inquisitor's age, turn to the paragraph with that number. If you do not know the answer, turn to 127. Okay. Again, we can solve this with algebra. Okay, let's say that his age is X. Let's just call his age X. Okay, let's erase all this. I don't need that now. Let's just say X is his age. X is his age. Okay, so that's uh, that's what we've assumed. We just we just called his age X. We don't know what it is yet, but it's definitely a number. Okay, so I first went to school of evil magic when I was four and a half years of age, and I stayed there for a sixth of my life. Okay, so. Okay, so four and a half is really 4.5, but I'm going to call it nine halves because I prefer to put things in terms of fractions. So, so, so he started the school of magic at the age of nine and a half. I mean, nine over two years, which is which is four and a half. Nine divided by two is four and a half, and then we add that to a sixth of his life. Now we know his life is age. Is x, so a sixth of x is just x over six. So we have x. So we have plus x over six. So that's done. Again, it's just a simple algebra problem. Um, and I stayed there for a sixth of my life. Then I went to the school of demonic sorcery for a fifth of my life. Okay, so so then he went for a fifth of his life. So that's uh, a fifth of his life is just x over five. That's 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 a fifth of his life. Okay, I then studied under the great necromancer Helmoon for a quarter of my life. Well, that's just x over four. Perfect. And then, um, and then, sin uh, and since then, for a third of my life, I have been in the service of Zagor. So a third of my life. So that's x over three. And now we know that all this equals his life, because that's how long he's been. That's how long he's been alive. So all of this, all this nonsense here on this line, just. Um, it just equals x, and now we just have to solve. Now this involves adding some annoying fractions. Let's let's start adding some fractions. Okay, right. Okay, so uh, let's ignore this fraction um, for now. Um, let's just add all the things with x's in it first. So um, a common denominator of all of them, six, five, four, three. Well, the best way to find a common denominator is well. It's to multiply them all together, but we're not going to do that because that's a bit awkward. Um, the lowest number into which they all go, uh, six goes into thirty, five goes into third, five goes into thirty. Pardon me. Uh, four doesn't go into thirty, but uh, four over two does. Uh, two goes into thirty, and three definitely goes into thirty. So if we just multiply thirty by two, then we can get them all in there. Um, definitely, they'd all go into that one. So nine halves. Plus, um, now we have to multiply whatever we do to the bottom, we have to do to the top. So to get from 6 to 60, which is our common denominator, we have to multiply uh, We have to multiply it by 10. So it's 10x over, over 60. Plus, uh, what did we do to 5 to turn it into 60? We multiplied it by 12, so that's, that's 12x over 60. And what do we do to 4 to get it to 60? We multiplied it by um, 15. So that's 50 plus 15x over 60. Uh, didn't, put the, didn't put the plus in there. Whoops. Now what do we do to 3 to get it to 60? We multiplied it by 20. So that's plus 20x over 60. Now let's uh, now let's deal with the normal fraction. That isn't an algebraic thing. We have no, we have no x in it. Now uh, to get to two to sixty, we multiply it by thirty. Thirty times nine uh, is nine times three times ten, so two hundred seventy. So two hundred seventy. So the whole thing is in brackets. Two hundred seventy 
Uh, let's add all these fractions together since it's now over a common denominator. 10 plus 12 plus 15 plus 20. Uh, 22, um, 37, 57, plus 57x, uh, all over 60, equals x. All right, let's, let's, let's do the next line. Okay, so now what we want to do, we want to multiply both sides by 60 to get rid of that over 60 nonsense. So now we just end up with 270 plus 57x. Uh, equals uh, 60x. x times 60 is 60x. Next line. Okay, now, if you notice, we have some like terms. If we subtract 57x from both sides, we get 270 plus 57x minus 57x, which is naught, equals 60x minus 57x, which equals 3x. So we have 270 equals 3x. Now, to get rid of the... Uh, uh, the 3x, we just divide by 3, uh, to get rid of the 3 rather, uh, we just divide by 3. So 270 divided by 3 is uh, 90, so 90 equals 3x divided by 3, which is x, and we know his age um, represents his, uh, or, or rather we know x represents his age, so his age must be 90, and that's the answer, all with algebra, perfect. So, Turn to the paragraph with that number, which is 90. I love mathematical puzzles. OK. Correct, says the Inquisitor. You have earned the right to enter the inner sanctum of Firetop Mountain, where the harmony of the spheres aligns itself to chaos. If you wish, you may avail yourself of my library before you go. If you want to peruse some of his books, turn to 18. If you would rather walk through the cavern and into the tunnel at the far end, turn to 337. Okay, um, we'll decide what to do in the next video, because this video's gone over an hour now. I intended to stop it at 43 minutes, but I got sidetracked with those really interesting puzzles. Anyway, so... Um, yeah, so... Yeah, we'll decide what to do in the next video. So thank you very much for watching. In the next video, I'll decide whether to peruse some of his books um, or walk through the, the cavern in, into the tunnel at the far end. So thank you very much for watching and goodbye.